Hello YouTube and welcome to episode 11. So this will be a short and somewhat off the cuff episode, but I, I did want to let everybody know that I am continuing to work on this project and I do intend to move it forward. So uh, let's talk about the progress that's been made. Um, we'll talk about adding buffers to the address and data lines and this will essentially make the core circuit more robust in the way that it interfaces with uh, peripherals. We'll talk about adding RAM to the circuit and show a test program that proves that the RAM is working. So that's definitely an important milestone. And I'll talk a little bit about my plans for the actual construction of the circuit in a more permanent form. And the idea is to take parts of the circuit that we know are working, uh, build them on actual circuit boards that are then connected using a passive backplane. And I think what this will allow us to do is basically make incremental progress uh, in a way that is both kind of mechanically robust and sound and also uh, compact and that it doesn't take up as much room as a huge collection of breadboards would. Uh, and then I'll talk in general where I think uh, about where I think the project is going. All right, let's get started. Okay, so here is the schematic for the new version of the circuit, and I have split it into two sub-circuits, one for the CPU and the glue logic and the other for the memory devices. So uh, let's look at the um, CPU plus glue logic schematic, and it is similar to what we had before. You know, here's the CPU, here's our glue logic, here's our address decoding, uh, more or less the same. Um, what has been added is now all of the address lines are going into uh, these two 748CT245 uh, bus transceivers uh, used in one directional mode. So they're basically just taking the address signals that the CPU is generating and then sending them out onto uh, sort of external versions of the address lines. And so the idea is that we gain two advantages by adding these, uh, these buffers to the address lines. One is uh, it protects the CPU from uh, you know, miswiring and potentially, you know, shorts to ground and things like that, um, that might occur in our um, interfacing with peripheral devices. And then also the output drive capability of these uh, 748CT devices is generally better than uh, kind of the old, like, LS um, TTL logic. So, uh, you know, we're able to sort of drive uh, potentially more peripheral devices, um, you know, because we may have a lot of peripherals hooked up to these, uh, these address lines. Okay, so in addition to the uh, 748CT245 devices that we're using as buffers for the address signals, we also have a 748CT245 device that is used as a bus transceiver for the data signals uh, that are um, going uh, to and from the CPU. So unlike with the address buffers, where we are just using these as sort of one directional buffers. Uh, we are using uh, the data bus transceiver as a two direction device. So depending on whether the write, read write signal is high or low, um, if it's high, data values on the data bus are sent towards the CPU and are essentially fed into the uh, the data inputs uh, on the CPU. Um, if the RW signal is low, that means the CPU wants to write, and we take the data that is output on the data pins of the CPU and, and send them out towards the external data bus. And the advantages we get with this bus transceiver are similar to the advantages we get with the uh, address uh, line buffers, which is that we are protecting the CPU uh, from you know possible damage if uh, peripheral circuits are miswired, and then we also get a better drive capability you know that we might get from the uh, CPU itself because this is a modern uh, uh, CMOS device. Okay so now that we've looked at the buffers that are uh, used for the address lines and the data lines uh, let's look at this other sub circuit that contains our memory devices and this is pretty similar to what we had before so here is the 28C256 EEPROM device that's interfaced in more or less the same way as before uh, really the only difference is that the address lines and the data lines are now connected to those bus transceivers rather than being connected directly to the CPU the new addition here is this 32K static RAM chip that is also interfaced in a very straightforward way uh, 
One interesting thing to note about the RAM chip is how the chip select for the RAM uh, for the RAM chip is generated. It is simply the high address line A15. So the idea is this RAM chip is mapped into the low 32K of the address space. So if A15 is low, meaning that the highest bit in the address is a zero, uh, that essentially asserts the chip select here and wakes up the RAM device and it responds to uh, the other address lines. Uh, if A15 is high, then that means we're accessing the, something that is definitely not in the low 32K of the address space. And uh, that uh, means that the chip select is not asserted and the RAM does not respond to addresses in that range. Uh, otherwise, uh, you know, we're, we're using the uh, memory read and memory write signals generated by the glue logic to tell the RAM whether we are reading data or writing data. Um, and so this is pretty uh, straightforward. All we really have to do is wire this into the circuit. So uh, let's look at our prototype circuit. All right, so uh, here's our uh, improved version of the prototype circuit. And one of the things you notice is that I have completely disregarded my rule about not running jumper wires over integrated circuits. And I'll explain to you why I uh, made that decision in a moment. But uh, basically what we're seeing here is that uh, underneath this nest of wires is our 3748CT245 devices that are the, uh, the address buffers, that's basically here and here, and then over here is the uh, data bus transceiver. And uh, these uh, sets of eight jumpers are uh, bridging the um, address lines and data lines from the CPU to those buffers so that they can be distributed to the uh, peripheral devices. So that's all uh, working here. Uh, the glue logic is exactly the same as before, no changes there. Um, uh, here is our ROM device, again, in a zip socket so that we can easily you know, uh, take out the ROM and program it and put it back in. Uh, under here, under this nest of wires is our 32K static RAM. Um, that is all uh, hooked up and, and working. And uh, down here, again, is just a, um, uh, in this part of the circuit here, is a 8-bit um, uh, output port, a 748CT574 um, device. And it's just hooked up to this little 1-byte uh, uh, hexadecimal display. And uh, a program that is running in the ROM is essentially just counting up from 0 to 255 uh, and repeating. Um, the interesting thing to note here is that these uh, data values are being stored in a memory location that is in the RAM. Uh, also, the program that we have loaded uses subroutines. Um, and of course, uh, subroutines in 6809 assembly language uh, require the use of a, a, a stack uh, that is uh, resident in, in RAM. So both of those factors, both the fact that we have a variable in RAM and we're using subroutines that require a call stack, both indicate that the RAM is working properly. So at this point, we have a circuit that does include both ROM and RAM uh, and uh, a, a little uh, some, somewhat trivial uh, peripheral device, which is this output port here. Um, okay, so uh, let's look at the program that is running. All right, so before we look at the program, I wanted to mention one other thing, which is uh, this chip here, this 748CT365, um, that's actually another buffer chip that has been added to the glue logic, and its job is to buffer control signals that are generated by the CPU and the glue logic for distribution to the peripheral devices. So that includes things like the uh, the E signal, that is essentially a bus timing signal that the CPU generates. That includes the memory read and memory write signals. So so th uh, that's what this new chip is doing. It's just buffering control signals. Okay, here is our test program. So as with our previous test program, we have an output port at 8000. Um, so we can you know, send data to it, and that way we have a display that will tell us you know, what our program is doing. Um, what's new in this test program is that we now have a variable in RAM at address 1000 hex. So that's, uh, we're going to store you know, a one byte data value there. Um, as always, we skip the 4K um, in uh, at the beginning of the upper half of the address space. That's our I.O. region. So our code uh, begins at 9000 hex. So here's the entry point to the program. The very first thing we do is uh, set up a stack in the high part of RAM. Setting up a stack allows us to use the uh, uh, JSR 
and RTS instructions to call subroutines and return from subroutines. So we can now uh, have functions and decompose our programs into functions, which is tremendous. Um, so the actual uh, sort of semantics of the program is that we start by storing a zero into the count variable, um, and then the main loop uh, loads the current value of the count variable, sends the count value to the output port, and we'll see it on that hexadecimal display. Uh, we then increment the A register, and that increments the count by one. We store the updated value back to the count variable, call a delay routine, and the details aren't uh, critical, but basically waste some time uh, so that we can actually see the counter incrementing rather than just having it be sort of a blur. Uh, and then we jump back to the uh, beginning of the main loop again and just keep doing that over and over again. So the fact that we are both uh, accessing a variable in RAM and also calling a subroutine, both of those factors mean that we have high confidence that the RAM is working correctly. So I mentioned uh, at the beginning of the video that I had constructed the circuit on the breadboard in a way that I wouldn't normally do, where I had jumpers flying over the ICs and it was basically a big mess, and mentioned I would uh, tell you uh, why I was doing that. So here is the idea. Um, I'm going to start taking portions of the circuit that I have a high confidence are working and constructing them in a permanent form on a protoboard. And uh, I don't have a protoboard big enough for the entire eventual circuit. Uh, and so what I'm going to do is build it in uh, increments, basically as modular units, and use a passive backplane to connect them. So here is my design for a passive backplane. And there's sort of nothing particularly special about it. All a passive backplane really is, is it's just a set of connectors that you can attach uh, PC boards to, and I'm going to attach, uh, you know, prototyping boards to them. Um, and I'm using two by 40 um, uh, pin headers, essentially. I'm going to use male ones on the backplane board and then female ones on the actual uh, sort of circuit submodules that I construct. And all the backplane PCB does is just connects the pins on the various connectors to each other. And the advantage to using a backplane is that it eliminates all of these sort of masses of wires necessary to wire parallel buses, you know, to a large degree because they go into the backplane rather than being, uh, you know, sort of rather than creating a requirement that you route them around your prototype circuit. And, and so I think you know, this will make the circuit construction once much more manageable. I'll take portions of the circuit that I am, you know, confident or, you know, pretty much done, you know, build them onto uh, protoboards, attach them to the backplane, and then the, the parts that I am working on that I'm sort of actively prototyping, I will build on breadboards and I can, you know, interface the breadboard, you know, using jumpers to the to the backplane. Uh, and, and so I'm, uh, I have high hopes that this is going to be uh, a, a way to really make the progress concrete. You know, I, I really don't like having huge amounts of breadboards just kind of lying around, you know, like one, you know, wire gets loose and now suddenly the thing doesn't work and you don't know why. So I think this is going to uh, allow me to make, you know, better progress, more reliable progress. So I've ordered these uh, backplane PCBs. Uh, they should be uh, arriving sometime in the next week or two. Uh, I don't know exactly when the next video will be, but I am planning to uh, basically build the core of the circuit, uh, the basically the CPU and the glue logic and the buffers onto uh, a, um, a, a protoboard, and that will become essentially kind of the first sub-circuit. And then I can start working on the sub-modules. Probably the next one will include uh, you know, the, the, the memory and probably also some peripheral chips. Um, so anyway, that, that's my idea for making progress. And, uh, you know, I'm kind of excited about this because it means that the project really is going to become an actual, you know, sort of permanent, uh, you know, installation. So we'll, we'll see how we'll see how that works. Well, I just want to mention while we're here that uh, KiCad, uh, my favorite electronic design automation software, and you should totally learn KiCad because it's awesome, um, has this really cool feature that when you design a printed circuit board, it will give you this 3D preview where you can actually see what the 
fabbed board will look like. So, you know, here's the back plane board, but you can, you know, rotate it around, you know, look at the, the top and the bottom, you know, you can, you know, zoom in and see that the, you know, that the, the traces are kind of in the right place. And it, it's really awesome. So, um, uh, you know, it, this gave me some pretty good confidence that this back plane board is going to be suitable for the, you know, the purpose that I intend it for. So, so anyway, KiCad is awesome. You guys should uh, really, really check that out. All right. So just to make it clear uh, what the first uh, sort of circuit submodule I'm going to build is going to encompass and sort of how it will um, attached to the back plane. So here is a proto board, uh, which you will notice is more or less the exact size of the portion of the prototype circuit that includes uh, the CPU and the glue logic and the buffers for the address and data buses. So, so, so that essentially, you know, is the the core of the circuit. So that'll be the first uh, module that I build, and I'm going to build it onto this particular uh, proto board. Um, so. Uh, and, and then basically once that's set up, I can, you know, build additional modules that include, you know, peripheral devices and memory and basically all of the things that are necessary to support the, the, the core module. All right, so that's a good place to wrap up. And let's talk about what we're going to do next. So my goal is to, uh, in the next video, get the back plane up and running and construct the core module consisting of the CPU and the glue logic. And then maybe also start to work on the uh, first sub-module for the back plane, which uh, I think is going to be the memory and peripheral board. So clearly we need ROM and RAM. Uh, but we can also start integrating some devices such as a UART for serial communication, uh, GPIO uh, just for arbitrary digital input and output and a timer and counter uh, for uh, basically timing and uh, timer interrupts. So uh, stay tuned and I will see you in the next video.